Welcome to the Agency Insider podcast today. We have a special guest, BB Raven, also known as BB the Link Builder. BB is an expert in SEO and link building, known for our creative and rather edgy tactics. Today, we will delve into our journey, explore our innovative techniques, and gain insight into the future of link building. Let's get started. <laughs> Hi, baby. Hello. Hi. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started in SEO and specifically link building? Yeah. So I won't go too far back because that's kind of boring, but I'll, I'll make it short. So basically I dropped out of university and then I had a lot of odd jobs. And eventually I realized I wanted to work from home to be with my kids, my baby. So I became a social media marketer, a uh, Facebook marketer from a company called Klein Trucks. They're a worldwide group in, uh, in uh, truck trading. And I even wanted to have more freedom. So then I Googled how to make money online and I got into affiliate sites. And I got in, in contact with other affiliate site owners. And they asked me to build links for them and uh, it was good pay, you know? So I thought like, I'll do that while I work on my own sites. That, that last part never really happened because I got so busy that, uh, yeah, only did links. Okay. Okay. And, uh, so, so what were some of the biggest challenges you faced early on? Um, yeah, so I don't want to complain. But I always had clients before I knew I wanted to business, right? And it was always inbound leads, which is great. But in the beginning, I didn't, I wasn't really great at organizing stuff, not great at project management. So I got way too many projects and didn't, you know, how to execute them uh, efficiently. And I think that was one of the biggest challenges where I really made a mess of things and got really behind on links and all that stuff. Uh, but then I connected with my now business partner and he's good at the operations side of things, like the project management stuff. So that really saved it a lot. So that was one of the biggest challenges. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and of course, besides the money, what else inspire you to focus specifically on uh, link builder uh, in a broader SEO field? Um, well, it was, to be honest, it wasn't really a conscious choice. It was just something specialization, right? Because people asked me for it and I was good at it. I think it's, it's one of the things that a lot of SEOs avoid to do because you have to deal with editors and actual humans instead of doing everything on your computer. So it wasn't a conscious choice. It was just something, uh, I was able to do. And, uh, it does sort of help to really specialize into something. So you're not uh, responsible for 10 million things. You're just responsible for this one uh, set of deliverables and people are willing to pay uh, maybe a bit more than they would for all round stuff. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. So, so let's talk about your specialty, which is of course, link building. Yeah. Uh, yes. So you, you discuss a lot of link building techniques like shotgun sniper. So can you explain to our listeners what exactly these strategies are and how do you use for different clients? Yeah. So I never talked about shotgun to be honest. So I don't know where you read that because <laughs> I don't know where you got that from the shotgun stuff. Yeah. But other strategies you follow for link building, like not shotgun, but, uh, Otherwise, what kind of a link building techniques you follow this? Just simple, find a website, outreach them, or there is another way also? Yeah, basically it's, I specialize in two types of link building. One is guest post outreach and yeah. the other one is creating a linkable assets that are easy to build links to or get links passively. So those are the two main link building strategies. So that means you help clients with content as well. Yeah. Yeah. I used okay. to do only the ideas, but lately we're, we've also gotten into creating more of the assets ourselves. Okay. So, uh, can you take us through a workflow? How does that go about for our audience? The, you mean the guest post outreach or the linkable asset stuff? Linkable assets. Oh yeah. Um, it's always hard to talk about it theoretically. So I usually like to take a more practical approach so we can take, uh, you say a niche and I'll, I'll try to talk you through what I would do for that niche. Okay. Uh, let's take a legal niche. 
okay, cool. Yeah, I have legal clients. So first we uh, help determine the target page. Sometimes the client already has target pages. Uh, other times we do the analysis and we help determine it. And if it's a really commercial page, it can be harder to build links to it. So then we look what are any supporting pages, right? That can help. And sometimes it also helps to uh, create new content if there are no supportive pages that we think are easy to build links to. And what I usually do is that um, I use Ahrefs a lot especially the content, yeah, especially the content explorer, but we always do a brainstorm session with our team. So we do like two to three brainstorm sessions and I use Ahrefs a lot, but they use other methods. Some of them use TikTok or, or AI, you know, or just their common sense, or they ask their friends and family. And then we get a sheet together and just dump ideas. And it's a very free brainstorm session. So there's no judgment. Usually okay. the ideas start really close to the product or service. So if it's a legal thing, it might be anything around the, the legal surface. But then when you go further down the brainstorm sheets, as your mind start, starts working, right, you come to more topics that are more tangentially relevant or satellite topics. So that's the first session. We just jump, dump a lot of ideas. So that's usually between 60 and 80 ideas. Then. Okay go uh, through uh, the validation phase and there we look for any indication that an idea might work so i use content explorer so i would look uh, if the idea something similar exists already and if it's getting a lot of links or twitter uh, or tweets or pinterest shares or something like that and uh, but you can also look other look at TikTok, right to see if it gets a lot of likes there or something like that so that's the validation phase. It doesn't mean though that everything has to ha already have proof. You know, sometimes you really know something is a good idea and it hasn't been done before, but you just know in your gut that it, it will work. So we put all these validation things in the sheet and then we make a short list of the things that we think will work, will be easy to build links to or get a lot of it passively. And then we run them by the client and out of these six, seven ideas, they choose one or two. And we run with it. So that's basically the process. Of course, you can do outreach for the uh, linkable assets to boost them up or to see yeah, how. That's what I was coming to. So uh, once the linkable asset is live, what, what is the next step? Do you do outreach or do you just leave it out there hoping somebody will catch it? It depends a little bit on the strength of the domain or, you know, or uh, how easy we think it will be to get picked up. But we usually build a couple of links to it just to, to get it going, right? And I think also it's a great way to get some proof because when you do outreach and everybody, you know, nobody likes the linkable asset, then it's, then, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. You have to change it or you have to come up with something else. It's a little bit of an experiment because, you know, sometimes they fail and sometimes they work. So when you are doing this outreach for a linkable assets, is this a different way of outreach when you are outreaching for, let's say, a guest post link? So the pitching and the whole thing is different or it's almost same? No, it's a different because you need to, uh, the value proposition is different. So why would somebody reach, uh, why would somebody link to your uh, linkable assets? Sometimes, okay. sometimes it's, it does, sometimes it's, there's an overlap. Because the linkable mm -hmm. assets, uh, they don't have content that really would link out to the linkable asset. Right. So then you then you pitch to write something that could link to the linkable asset. So then it's sort of like a guest post linkable asset. Right. Normally what people do is when they build a linkable asset, then they reach out to journalists or other websites to share some snippets of it or to talk about it. Is that what you also do? Yeah, it depends a little bit on what type of linkable asset it is, right? So you could reach out to journalists, but also to industry leaders or okay. to um, companies that uh, maybe, you know, if it's around the legal niche, there might be something in there that helps their audience avoid legal costs, you know, something about liability. So then yeah. you can reach out to companies that cater to the same type of audience so let's say that there's a new regulation around taxes or something and you know that if somebody doesn't isn't aware of those regulations they could get into legal trouble so you reach out to accounting software to inform their clients that this is happening so they don't run the risk of you know all those legal problems okay so it's something close to kind of digital peer right um, not exactly the work, but the asset building 
Yeah, so I'm not a super expert in digital PR. I do want to get into it. So I'm following uh, Gabriela Cove. I really like her. She's from Bright Valley Marketing. You should get her on this, by the way. She's great. Yeah, and she she does a PR outreach. And I always was very hesitant about reaching out to a lot of journalists. But she said, she told me it's basically the same, right? The message should be a little bit shorter, more to the point. But at the same time, it's it's really the same. So, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was my next question was thought of going into digital PR because that's a, because honestly, that's where the money is. Yeah. I think, I don't know if, if that's, if I would make, not sure if I would make more because my prices are the same. I will always charge the same price, but I okay. think I might be able to save on labor costs because the guest post outreach is quite labor intensive, you know, especially oh. the way I do it. Cause I usually go for unpaid links, right? So if you do paid links, it's quite easy. But because I go mostly for unpaid links, you go through a whole editorial process right. with link right. prospect as well. Okay. That can be a total nightmare. Right, right, right. So, so what are the biggest challenges you face when working with clients on link building? With clients? You mean like uh, um, challenges in working with clients? Yes. So okay, sorry. In terms of uh, they not accepting some kind of link or their expectations and your delivery being mismatched or they are very clear? Yeah, unfortunately that, that does happen. Um, I try to minimize it as much as possible. So for instance, when a lead comes in, I send them a list of 25 questions and it's a list. So I learn more about the leads and they learn more about me and to see if we're a match, right? Because I don't want to work with somebody who doesn't really understand how I work or what to expect. But still, there can be some problems with that. And I think it's to avoid that, I think it's really important to talk a lot in the beginning, to have a lot of communication and also to feel uh, like it's a very safe environment. So if they're not happy with the link or, or something else is, is a problem that they can say it to me and then I can correct course, right? Or I can explain things. So the biggest challenge I think is the communicational differences sometimes. Sometimes I assume something is completely clear and for instance, if, if I do pay for a link, which does sometimes happen, it's at my cost. So I don't, I pay for the link and I'm not going to ask the client to pay for a link. So it's not extra cost, but, uh, for some reason, even though I think I've explained it a lot, the client still thinks that they have to pay for the link. And I'm like, no, 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 it's all included. And it's so weird because I, I, I now feel like it's at 10 different points in the contract, in my services page, on the onboarding call. So. Maybe it's me. I, I sometimes maybe I'm not clear or something. So yeah, communication. Okay. Okay. And, uh, so normally the link building agencies sell link based on their parameters, like domain ratings or organic traffic. So how do you, so what exactly the parameters you generally have for these links, which you are building? Yeah, so I'm not metrics focused, so I focus more on authenticity and relevance. So that's what I look for in sites. Um, but some clients do want to follow a minimum, and that's usually uh, DR25 and traffic 1,000. That's, the, that's then the, the minimum. And I also vet the sites, you know, for outgoing links, if they're a link seller and all those things. But it's not metrics focused. Okay, so are there any other um, methods you use to ensure quality and relevancy of the uh, links you build for the clients? Yeah, so I look at the outbound links if they're going, to, if they're selling to gambling and that kind of stuff, right? The sensitive niches. Um, I look at the traffic flow if it if it goes down or is increasing or other uh, things. And but we also look at the site itself. So if it's um, if it's a, uh, if it fits the target page, if it's relevant and if it's not a random site. So you have these sites that, that, you know, they talk about businesses and then they talk about dildos and I'm like, yeah, that's random. That's not going to fit. Yeah. It's clearly not a really focused site or anything. What else do we look for? We also look for how they reply in the inbox. So if a reply comes back from a site and they're like, yeah, and I have 25 other sites then I'm like. <laughs> That's no, true. maybe not. And it's not that I, I don't mind if somebody's asking for money for a link, but I do mind when it's, when they don't have any criteria for the buyer. So 
if a site is very, very, very easy to get a link on, you know, even if you're paying, then it's usually a red flag for me. Right, 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 right. Makes sense. Now, so you are known for your creative outreach. Yeah. We're going to go a little bit into it. Yeah. So, of course, your outreach emails are known for being highly creative and humorous. Can you share some examples of your most successful outreach campaign and what made them stand out? Uh, yeah. So, I got to give props to my team because I don't create the templates anymore most of the time. So, uh, that, that's, that's been for a couple of years now. So, the team does it. And the people mm-hmm. I hire, they're usually very creative. Sometimes they're copywriters, right? And their their templates, they can be funny, but they're not always funny. They're always very much focused on the on the prospect, you know, what's going on on their end of, of the inbox. And uh, let me think about, yeah. So I think one template that works really well is in the photography niche. And it reaches out to blogs that talk about photography or photograph software and all that kind of stuff. And it's the it's a little bit flirty. So in the subject line, it starts with, um, what's it now? Let's go in a dark room and see what develops. And when I, when I saw that first, for the template for the first time, I really thought, oh no, we can't do this. This is just way, this, this is not good. And then the person that created the template said, yeah, but I, we already sent this out and we got a really high response rate. And I think. I think the template worked well because it was a dad joke a little bit. It was a little cheesy, but it was also a little bit flirty, but not creepy. And also this, the person that sends it is a woman. So that's, I think if you send it as a man, it's a whole different vibe. It's very targeted for the photography niche. So it had all these references to photos in it. So I think that that worked really well. Another one that worked really well was, I think it was going to marketing websites. And this was, this was from another team member of mine, uh, Sammy. Was it Sammy? Yeah, I think so. And the whole t- template was based on storytelling, which uh, back then was a big hype in the marketing. And what he did was he made the template sequence like chapters in a book. So the first email was called chapter one. And it, it had a, a photo in it or an image in it of a typewriter, like a really old fashioned typewriter. And a greeting for the person was on the, the paper in the typewriter. And then the second email was chapter two. And then, you know, final chapter was the last follow up. And he just told this whole story through sequence, which I thought was really cool. And that worked really well. So that was a for, ma- for a marketing niche. Yeah, that was for the marketing niche. Okay. So those are interesting. Things. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, what I've learned through years is that sometimes I don't think a template will work, but then I'm wrong, you know? And and I also teach other agencies how to write emails, and I never show them examples, I never show them templates, because I think everybody should find a way of writing emails that fits them. Because if you're trying to do something else, if you're trying to be Seth Godin or whatever, um, it's not going to work. You really have to find your own kind of hook right yeah okay that makes sense yeah. so so do you do agency trainings as well as you said okay we'll, yeah. we'll come into a training part uh, shortly where i'll ask now oh, cool. these questions, yeah it's the next but just for the outreach part so what are some of the common mistakes you see people making in their outreach uh, efforts i think one mistake is that they think that well two mistakes actually one is they copy a successful template and then they keep using it. But I think a template does have an expiration date because for some reason it gets out in the world, it gets used by more and more people. And then the people that receive the email, they start recognizing it. And it doesn't matter how good it sounds or whatever thing you're using in it, it doesn't work anymore. So you you just have to keep following the progress of your templates and then change them, right? The other uh, mistake is... Um, Wait, what was it now? Oh, I forgot. I had another mistake. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. The other mistake is that people are so obsessed with scaling that they forget about conversion rates. So, there's a balance between the two, right? I understand right. scaling. It's very efficient. Um, I think if you go for paid links, it's probably okay. You know, if you send out some people, it's, it's, it's money-wise. Financially, it's very, it makes sense. Right. But if you do want to have some sort of unpaid links in there, don't be so obsessed with scaling, but also look at your conversion. And then might might be 
that in the beginning, when you start your campaign, you have to put, what, four hours into a template. And it sounds like a lot of work, but if it gets your conversion rates up, it's really worth it. And if it gets you the, the times that people uh, flag you for spam, if you get that down, it actually also saves you money because you don't have to use another email and have that whole system, you know, set up. So I think uh, people are so focused on scaling and, and, you know, in, in every industry, too much focus on scaling is bad. I mean, look at the climate change. This, this is all about people yeah. not producing shit, right? So we got to go back to a little bit more quality and conversion rate. And do you think people sometime, I mean, a common mistake, which I see is not researching the website, just hitting the info or a contact us email ID. That seems to be a very common mistake, not researching the website I, and just hitting for the uh, hitting in the mail and asking for backlinks. Yeah, I think you have to, you have to pay attention to every step uh, of the way. So sometimes people, they're so focused on the outreach that they ask me, you know, how do I create a, a perfect outreach email? And then I say, well, look at why you're doing it. Why are you doing the outreach? Because you don't have, if you don't have a good reason why you're reaching out to this type of prospect, it's going to show in your value proposition, right? So start at the beginning of your strategy or sometimes they will think oh, my, my email doesn't work. It doesn't convert, but look at the way you're prospecting. Maybe you're only reaching out to sites that will never allow you to guest post or are only obsessed with money, right? Or look at your, uh, how you manage the inbox. Sometimes a person's campaign can be so great. And then in the inbox, they change the, the tone of their voice. So they'll reach out with a really heartfelt, serious, warm email. And then a person prospect replies, and then they go back to thank you for applying to my email or something. I don't know, <laughs> you know, and, and the person yeah. replying to the email is like, this is not the person who I was talking to. Right, right. right. Yeah. So, so, so we don't do any outreach. I mean, we don't take any inbound links or uh, links for page traffic. But I get requests on all of our channels. Sometimes people are so desperate. How much, just type how much money, how much for, that's it. One okay. year, and they come on my LinkedIn, they come on my Facebook, oh. everywhere it's a headache for every day we receive at least 10, 20 of these where people are desperate enough to get the links no matter what. They don't yeah. even see if we have it or not. And, it's, and the thing is also that probably works, right? You just have to do it a thousand times with a bot or something and it works. But do you really want to do that? So you got to pick the method that works well for you. It's right. it's kind of like guys pick, this is going to be horrible, but guys picking up women in, in, a, in a bar, you know, some of them are so desperate. They just use the same opening line <laughs> and then, you know, like 200 women. Maybe at some point it works, but is that really what you want? So I don't know. Don't be that guy. <laughs> now, now I have seen late, uh, not lately, but I've seen a trend where people are, uh, where bigger websites now tends to be mailing you for a three-way link. So oh, yeah. what is your take on it? And have you been doing something like that? Yeah. So first of all, those it's not the websites reaching out to you. It's a link builder. Yeah. So they're using a link builder to do it. So you're never actually talking to the website itself. Well, sometimes it in, it's in-house, but often it's not. I think it's a really good system. I haven't been able to work it well because I do... I've tried it a little bit working with somebody, but the thing is, is that I'm very transparent and open to my clients. So I tell them how, how, how I'm getting the link, what the deal is. You know, I, I, I want the client's approval for where their link is going, how it's placed and all that stuff. And the people that do three-way systems, not all of them, but a lot of them, they just have a giant list. Or, and they have all these Slack communities and Facebook things and whatever. And I used to very quickly do like, tac, 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 they do the three-way exchange. And so if you, if you need your client approval, it's going to, you're going to be way too slow. Right. And it's, it's a nightmare, but I think if you have a good system and your client is okay with it and you right. make sure the placement is correct, I think it's good. Unfortunately, sometimes you can see an article and it's like, uh, I don't know, there are like 50 links in there. And you know, it's just, it's just the dumping ground to get right. that link quota, the three-way link clubs. I think every, every strategy or method has its merits. It's all in the execution, how you do it. Right. Okay. So yeah. I, I, for example, I've seen people 
been able to get links from americanexpress.com so you know that's awesome if you yeah. do it well <laughs> yeah. but yeah there is a method of course it's not straight link building they you will get a quote of your ceo in that with a link okay so we spoke with yeah. the builder how does she use credit cards for like that i think i think it's nice you know if 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 it's part of your link mix i don't see yes, any no. problem with it but if it's your only strategy and you're doing it in a way that's that starts to look more like um link wheel or i don't know you know back in the days they were called pbn or whatever it's just uh yeah just be careful right and and now we also see a lot of marketplaces coming up which are just selling oh, yeah. links with course for the money and i'm sure but, but so how how what is your take on these i mean marketplace versus you hardcore manually doing link links yeah again I, i think a couple of links on a marketplace shouldn't be bad if you vet the site real well and if you keep an eye on it and make sure your placement is relevant and looks natural however there are so many people that use these marketplaces over and over and over again and you know you can see all the competitors basically have the same links from the same marketplace and i wonder how valuable it is you know and and if it, if it can be risky at some point for a penalty so i would again i would never focus on that as my only link strategy i would just maybe pick a couple of them that, that look really good and then do additional ones through other methods if i if i um if i have one tip for companies that are getting into link building is that i would just start it yourself first and fail maybe because so you understand how it works and then you might be able then decide that you don't want to do it and hire a link builder or an agency or whatever but if you do it yourself first and really look at the links that you easy links that you're not getting so i'm um uh i've been consulting uh, amnesty international at this point and you would think that they they get easy links or whatever and and they actually do but there are so many links that they that they could have gotten that they just lie, leave on the table so it's a, their existing network or something or they get a mention somewhere and they don't go and try to get the link or whatever so always look at your at your own network first and what links you're you're forgetting about that you could easily get yourself right 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 that's a good that's a good idea yeah yeah so we're going to talk a little bit about training and uh, team building Cool. Yeah. So you, of course, how how important do you think training teams in link building is? And do you train your people? Do you have SOPs, or how do you do that onboarding process? Yeah. So I think when I when before I hire people, I usually do a test to see if they can follow instructions, but also to see if they have some creative bone in their body. Uh, and the test is actually really close to what they would be doing. So it's basically writing an email. to a specific site. And then I also tell them don't use um don't use anything you see online, don't use any template, just write an email. And so the the people that I think the recruitment is really important because if somebody doesn't have that little spark, you know, or doesn't know how to write good casual English, um right. you're it's going to take you so much time to teach them that if if you can even teach them that, right? So that's really important. And then when I train them they can choose to do well i train them on all aspects of link building but then they can choose if they want to focus on the creative stuff or just the data stuff or do both of them because you can't be creative all day you know sometimes you need some brainless stuff to to do. actually actually data stuff isn't brainless by the way it's really it's really hard so what i do then but let's focus on the creative stuff right because that's the that's usually the hardest thing is that i start with bespoke emails so bespoke emails are emails you only send to one site and your whole email needs to be absolutely bespoke it cannot be sent to another health site or to another legal site so they really have to go into the site and research and then write the email and whatever and it has to sound okay and then i give feedback and then they you know we go through revisions um and they write about 5 to 10 bespoke emails And the cool thing is is that when you focus on a specific niche but you are writing bespoke emails that there are some pattern that comes up because you're writing to the same type of sites but the, it's bespoke for every site but then you start seeing oh they all have green smoothies right and then you are ready to actually create a template but you've done the research in a niche you know how to 
write a bespoke email that breaks you out of some kind of box where you what you about what you think an email should be. Um, and then they write a template. Uh, and then that goes to revisions as well. But what, what we also do in a training usually is that when they write the bespoke email, when it's okay, when it's 80% okay, we send it out just to see what happens. Uh, bespoke emails actually have a really high conversion rate, but they take too much time and headspace. It's like, yeah. So a template is the, is a nice in between uh, thing. Yeah. So what, what skill sets beside creativity and you look when you are hiring a person for link building? Yeah. So ideally somebody should be a very communicative. Uh, they can be introvert, right? But they need to uh, feel okay to ask questions or give a heads up when they're having problems and all this stuff. I, I think it's really important because all my, all the people I work with are remote. If they don't communicate with me, I have no idea what's going on. And of course, of course, I understand if you're having a difficult time in your life or something happens, but please tell me, right? Because we're depending on you. So that's right. something I learned the hard way, <laughs> really look for in a person. So yeah. sometimes when I do a test for the recruitment, if I hire new people, I actually mess up the test and they have to ask me, you know, I can't access this thing or I can't, you know, that's, so that's it a way for me to see are they communicating if they're, they're stuck so communicative skills the other thing is i attention to detail and that's also really important yeah so yeah and it's something i also do test in the recruitment so i ask for specific so for instance if i post a job post it's a really long job post and you have to read all the way through it and there's also a video in it that introduces where i introduce myself but okay. the actual test is hidden in a video at the end of the video. So the person has to watch the whole video and then actually notice that the test is there and then they have to take action based on that. So that's how I test attention for detail. Okay. And uh, so how do you keep your team motivated and up to date with latest SEO trends? Yeah, that's a good question. So. We're link builders mostly, so we're not that involved in on-page SEO, SEO. And we we don't follow SEO trends that much. We should probably do more, but all in a day-to-day -day work, it doesn't. there's not always time to do it. So I do post stuff about SEO and I have them go through Ahrefs training videos and all this stuff. I, I don't think they're like hardcore SEO experts and I'm, I'm not either, but, uh, the team building part, that's, that's something that's, that's been really nice. So at some point I realized that I can't really promote people. They're just kind of stuck in their job and nobody really, you can become a team lead, but I don't, actually don't need that many team leads. I have, I have three, wait, I, yeah, I have two team leads and that's enough. Right. So then I read this book called the dream manager. And it was a, a book with a story about a big cleaning company where they had a huge turnover. So they had like, I don't know, people would, people would, um, how do you say, quit their jobs a lot. So what they did, they hired a dream manager and all the dream manager did was uh, coach people on realizing their dreams and it could be anything, right? So it could be personal business, whatever. So what we did was then we organized a group. And we invited people, it was voluntary. And all they do is that from the first session, they write down a hundred dreams in different categories. So it's like physical appearance, family, money, travel, all those kind of things, education. And they never get to hundred dreams, but they just get to a lot. And then with the group together, we pick out three dreams and then we identify what would be the first step to do this right? To get to this dream. Sometimes it's research, sometimes it's a, it's a daily action or whatever. And uh, every week we have like a half hour to 45 minutes where everybody says what they've done in terms of their dreams and what they're doing that week. And that's all we do. And then we have a channel, it's sort of like an accountability channel and people post every day what they've done. And I think that really, really helps with team building because you get to know each other. But also you get the feeling that you're also a human. You're not just somebody, not just an employee and you can bring your dreams to work. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons that I think some people I don't pay enough. I, I would like to pay them more, but I don't have that money, but they still stay and do the job because they get that feeling that they can also achieve other things than just, you know, money stuff. That's a very unique thing I heard in all my podcasts recently, honestly. 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's not. Yeah, I like it. Oh, we also do games and all that stuff, but it's just. Uh, yeah. So all your people work in work from office or they are work from home as well. They all work from home. Yeah. So uh, we've got uh, people working in the Philippines, Trinidad, Spain, US. Uh, yeah, I mean from the Netherlands. So how many people uh, team you have now? I think we now have twenty one. We used to have thirty, but um, it became really hard to manage for me. Well, I wasn't managing them, but it was just I realized this is too big, and uh, yeah. So then we 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 did have to let people go, and we became smaller. Okay. But I like it. Okay. So let's talk about next tools and techniques. I know awesome. you been a fan of which box, but can you share some other tools which you find indispensable for your link building campaigns and why you prefer them? Uh, except Pitbox and HRF, which of course stands to be your favorite. Yeah, so I'm a minimalist with tools, especially. Okay. So I always try to, uh, not a lot of tools. I know that there are amazing tools out there, but I, I just like to not use a lot. So we use uh, ClickUp for project management and okay. um, Slack for communication. I think that's it. Oh, and MidJourney. Okay. Oh, MidJourney, we also use it. Or image creation. Oh yeah, and AI tools. Yeah, the, so we use a uh, Gemini, Plot, um, yeah, all those. Things. So, are there any innovative techniques you are currently experimenting in your link building efforts? Yeah, so I got inspired by uh, Stacy McNaught. She is also a PR link builder, and she creates images for for uh, clients that um, get used in newspapers and stuff. And I really like that. So with her blessing, I'm trying that out too. Of course, it's just way harder than I thought it would be. Okay. <laughs> and she, you know, every time you talk to a specialist like a PR link builder, like, oh yeah, it's you just do this and this easy. And there, and then you start doing it, and then you find out, like, okay, this is not. Exactly. Yeah. So, but she she uses AI to create those images. So I've been uh, doing that too. Yeah, and other novel. Yeah, mainly the, the novel link builder stuff is that I use AI for images, image generation. Uh, so for one client, I did uh, it was around dating, and we did uh, odd couples we, with Midjourney. We generated weird couples. So for instance, the clown from It dating Winnie the Pooh. You know, so things like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? No, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and what do you enjoy most about your work in link building? I don't like the pressure. I know you asked me what what I enjoy. So one of the things that, that sometimes is really grinding and dragging is just constant pressure to deliver links, right? And it do, it is becoming harder and harder. So uh, when I started in link building, it was easier. But people back then were already saying it's hard. So this was like, I don't know, like six years ago or something. And now it's 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 just harder and harder. So that's what I don't like. But what I do like is that that I, I email people. An email is one of the most hated things on the planet. But it gives me a huge kick when prospects actually thank actually thank me for the email. It's like I'm doing cold email, I'm basically spamming you and you're thanking me for the email. That gives me a lot of like a rush, you know. So I love doing it. And what I also love is uh, because I don't focus on one niche, I do things like adult toys and then I do supplements and then I do accounting software and then I do legal, is that you get an insight in all these different businesses and learn how they make money or what kind of you know weird things are going on in that business. Use these insights for your advantage besides sleep building. No, but it does make me. Yeah, I, I do definitely want to do something else next to link building. Okay. You know, to learn more about and have an income and stuff. But uh, I should, I should, because it's it's interesting, for sure. So you said you started with affiliate uh, marketing. So do you still do that or no time for that? No. So so that's some, something I really regret because when I I started with affiliate sites. I knew how to get a lot of traffic, but I, I never thought about the monetization. So then I was like, okay, I'm getting a lot of traffic. 
now what? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and and at the time when I I started to monetize, then then people asked me to build links for them. So then I just did that, and all my affiliate sites died. I just neglected them and a lot of bad stuff and whatever. So I wanted to get big back into affiliate sites. So I was talking to Gail Breton, you know, from authority hackers and all this stuff, but then all these updates happened and now I'm like, okay, now right. what? So then I tried, now. sorry. I said, now is not the right time. <laughs> no, now I don't know. Yeah. I think, I think now it might not be the right time, but then, then I was like, maybe I'll try TikTok, you know, cause, uh, and then I thought, okay. oh, look, it's really, it's really toxic. It's addictive. Do I really want to do this? So I'm at this point, I'm 49 where I'm thinking, do I really want to make people buy stuff that don't need, you know? So I'm having a little bit of a marketing crisis. I want to make money, but at the same time, I don't want to get more crap into the world. Okay. Uh, so what do you believe are the most underrated aspects of link building that uh, more people should focus on? I think one is the prospecting. So if you're always prospecting in the same way and you're getting the same results back, it might not be your outreach. It might actually be the way you're prospecting. So for instance, uh, people do a lot of uh, topical, topical based prospecting where they're like, I want to find everybody who talks about hair loss. So I'm going to prospect on these keywords around hair loss, right? Which is fine, but everybody else is doing that. So maybe instead of doing hair loss, you should look at the audience, which companies have the same audience, but they're not competing with you. Maybe it's people that produce massaging oils, right? Because if you have hair loss, one of the tips is to massage your head with uh, oils. So if you reach out to companies that, that produce these massaging oils, yeah, they might not be ranking on the exact keyword that you want to rank for, or they might not have giant amounts of traffic. It might just be a small massage oral producer somewhere, but they still have your audience, you know, and it's, it's, it's a real authentic and relevant link. So I think the prospecting is important to switch that up a little bit. And the other part is the inbox management, because I really think people lose links there as well. And it's pretty. Right. Now, future of SEO and link building. So what do you, uh, I mean, how do you see the field of link building evolving in next five to 10 years? <laughs> I mean, I'm really bad at futures. <laughs> okay, let me rephrase if you want. How do you see it has evolved after the Google March update? So has it your, has the, has your, uh, I mean, the business gone up or has it gone down? People are scared to get into backlinks or SEO. So if you can throw it's, some light on. I want to say it's volatile. So it's, I get leads. They want to spend a lot of money, but then another client uh, passes because they're scared. They want to focus on other stuff. So it's very volatile or person, you know, so it's not necessarily less or something, but it's kind of more unpredictable. People right. make really fast decisions and that's, that's kind of hard. For the future of links, I don't know, you know, it, it's so every, every couple of months, one method is dead and then, then they, then they hail the other method. So for, for instance, for a little short while, guest posting was kind of like frowned upon mainly because people were doing a lot of paid guest posts, but then somebody found something in the Google release where it said, oh, guest posts might be okay. So now everybody wants to do guest posts again. And I think if you want to future proof yourself, just don't rely on one strategy. Yes, you have to focus on a strategy to learn how to do it well, but then start building up your portfolio and do a couple of more different things. That makes sense. And uh, so can you share some tips for the people who want to get started into link building? Link building for themselves or like as a business or as an agency? As an agency, I would say IDs, for IDs first. So make sure that you invest time and have the skills to come up with great ideas and then use different uh, link methods. Because I think that, that is what speaks to clients. If you show that you understand where they're coming from and that you have ideas for 
where to take it next. And that's something that they like. They like that attention. Yeah. So if you, if you start a link building, you should maybe start talking about uh, specific ideas you have for the medical niche or specific ideas you have for whatever. So how do you get, um, of course you started six years back. What is your, how do you get more leads from, is it from referrals? Is it uh, from agencies? So what kind of a breakup if you can? Share? Yeah. Most yeah, most of my links are inbound. I think it's mostly referrals, but I also think podcasts work really well. So like this, right? Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta put yourself, uh, out there and, uh, build up a name, but start with your own network and, uh, yeah, go from there. Yeah. Okay. And, uh. Any must read book or website recommendations? Because that's the question I love to ask. Because sometimes I ask and some people say, reading? I'm not into reading, but I, I guess you are into reading. Yeah, I do read, but I, I only read zombie books. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, really... Oh, yeah, I did the foreword for the uh, HRF's book, SEO for Beginners. Yeah, but enough. Yes, yes. Cool. Oh, I love that. Um, but. <sighs> I think for websites, I really like exploding topics, although lately it's, there's something weird going on, but I would, yeah, I would just follow those kind of trends, uh, aggregation sites. I don't know. Do you know any other ones that are good? Cause I only know, I think I only know ex exploding topics, but no, I think that's good enough. But, but for the book, you did mention the dream manager. I think that's a good book. I haven't read. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the dream manager. That's a good one. That, I, I'll put the link right in the comments below. Uh, so yeah. The just can find it. it the books yeah. sound very interesting, right? And find, and find industry leaders in other niches, I think. So that, that that's, that's the website I always follow when I try to come up with link building campaigns. I said, I look at, oh, what's going on in SaaS, you know, or what's going on in this industry that really helps. Don't, don't right. stick in the SEO bubble. Right. That is absolutely true. So with that, we come to the end of this uh, interesting session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bibi, for sharing your insights and experience with us today. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Where can our listeners find you online and learn more about you? Um, yeah, just go to bbbuzz.com and yeah. Google BB the Link Builder and you'll probably find some uh, weird... Oh, yeah. I started a YouTube channel. Nobody watches it, by the way. So please go watch it. I watched it. You made me watch it. What? Oh, that's so nice. I don't know. So I wanted to learn about video editing and that's why I started the channel. It's called Spam or Jam. And I just talk about email. Uh, and we also try not to just do outreach emails, but also look at sales emails or things like that. And then I have a guest. It's always really short, like eight minutes. Uh, we go through the email and then my, my feedback is mostly on the screen. So I don't talk, but it's all on the screen as comments when you see the email. But the guests, uh, they give their feedback and they give recommendations. So I had to, I've uh, seen that, right? It was, yeah. it was funny and interesting, right? It's yeah, it's cool. cool. Yeah. It's it got Direct. Mark Webster. Yes. Uh, yeah, Mark Webster, Sam, all was on it. So. Yes. Yes, I saw that. I okay, saw cool. That. You should be on there. Why not? Why not? Yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, next time, why not? Whenever you want, I'll be. Yeah, awesome. Okay. So thank you to our listeners for tuning into the Agency Insider podcast and be sure to check out B.B. Raven's work, her, new, her YouTube channel and stay tuned for our next episode. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good questions.